Hello and welcome to the Audio Epics podcast. Here we are again, me, Domine, and my wife Eileen. Yeah, I'm still here too. <laughs> yes, we're both here. Maybe this uh, episode is a good, um, a good time to make a small confession. Um, you've probably noticed, but I'm usually very nervous when I have to start this podcast. I don't speak up enough as a result, and that is because I'm very shy. I do have some amateur theater experience, but I always had a fear of situations where I had to be myself, like when I did oral exams or presentations. I'm in um, BNI, if you know what that is. It's a business network international, and we have a, a weekly 45-second presentation. Sometimes I have to do a training, and I'm always very nervous when I have to do that. And the same goes for this podcast, even though you cannot see me, which is a help. I'm really nervous doing this. Whenever I start a podcast like this, my accent gets all over the place after one minute, because I just... I have to focus uh, on, on keeping my calm. So... Here it is. <laughs> maybe it will help me in the future, uh, having said this. And maybe, I, I hope, through this podcast, it will get better. Because practice makes perfect, as you say. Thank you, Elin, for this beautiful testimony. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, it's quite fitting what you just said, because um, the topic of this week's episode is... Fear! So it's fear. Yes, fear. Yeah, and fear is a very important subject in storytelling because fear is the mind killer, right? I will face my fears. I will <laughs> let it pass through me. And <laughs> yeah, fear in storytelling obviously is based on the biggest, uh, most common fears in life because we like yeah. characters that we can... Yeah, exactly. So uh, part of what we'll talk about is um, how fear can be used to make a character more interesting uh, whether it's a main character, a villain, or a si sidekick, it can make the character more round and, you know, more fleshed out. Yeah, and I think uh, you have different kinds of fear uh, or different functions in storytelling. For example, uh, you have fear invoked by the story or the environment, the circumstances, the situation, versus fear inherent to the character. Uh, for example, because of a trauma or uh, another reason... And that's usually to make the character more interesting. Yeah, so we'll distinguish between fear for the audience and fear for the characters, really. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We'll talk about all of them. Yeah. So, uh, some examples of iconic fears, characters who have fears in, in stories. We came up with a short list here. Yeah, the, the first thing that came to my mind was uh, Indiana Jones yeah. and, and his fear of snakes. Yeah. Why did it have to be snakes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Another one is Captain Hook and his fear of the, the crocodile and the, the, the ticking clock. Yeah, it's like the, um, the crocodile swallowed a clock and that way he, that makes it easier for him because he can always tell when the crocodile is coming because, because he hears the ticking of the clock first. But that also results in the fact that he gets a fear of the sound of the ticking clock because he associates it with the crocodile. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I always thought of it as, um, in, a, in a sort of deeper sense, perhaps, he's afraid of time because Peter Pan is his nemesis. And Peter Pan um, wants to be, you know, young for, for all eternity. He doesn't want to grow up. So, in a way, Peter Pan is afraid of time. He's got a Peter Pan complex, as they say. And, and so, Captain Hook, um, maybe it's, it's kind of the same thing in a different way. I don't know. I've always thought of it as kind of telling yeah. that, that what he's afraid of is a clock. Oh, wow. That's, that's interesting. Like, like Captain Hook uh, fears his nemesis, who is eternally young, and therefore maybe fears his own age or, or aging. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Actually. I don't know if J.M. Barry did all of that deliberately. But maybe on some subconscious level, that's what was playing in his mind. Who knows? And then? Well, you have Batman, who has a fear of bats. And the cool thing about this hero is that he 
the first thing he wants to do before he becomes the Batman is um, face his ultimate fear of bats uh, yeah. and, and dress dresses up as a bat just to to intimidate his uh, his nemesis. I think. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why Batman Begins is my favorite Batman movie by far. And one of the reasons is that whole backstory of him being afraid of the bats and then when he goes into the cave and he deliberately, you know, makes himself stand there amidst the bats. Oh, and I love that scene. Yeah. Where he where he's crouching and then yeah. he he rises up suddenly. Yeah. The, yeah. the sound of all the bats around his love that. I love that. Why bats, Master Wayne? Bats frightened me. This time my enemies shared my dread. Apparently, uh, Wolverine, despite being a massive badass character, is afraid of flying, at least in uh, the movie version of X-Men. Yeah, it's, it's what they often do in storytelling, and I think it's really cool and interesting that even characters, uh, usually main characters, who have all these strengths and, and gifts, they still have uh, a main fear that makes them more relatable as a, a normal human being, like we are. <laughs> <laughs> that actually reminds me of something. Um, in the, in the, the comic series, the comic book series Asterix, mm -hmm. um, we mentioned it last time, the French uh, comic book series, which is very popular over here. Um, in the village of the Gauls, um, it's always uh, mentioned that they're not afraid of anything, except that the sky might fall down onto their heads. That's the one thing that they're afraid of, and they're always afraid that the sky is going to fall down. <laughs> but they're not afraid of anything else. Okay. So that's kind of a yeah fun thing. Like the Vikings were afraid of falling off the surface of the Earth or something. Yeah, I think it's like that, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, then we have uh, Truman Burbank from The Truman Show, who is uh, afraid of water. It's The story is about a man, and his whole life is actually a TV soap series, but he doesn't know that. Okay, yeah. He doesn't know that his whole life is, is basically fake. Um, everything is filmed. And all, all his siblings and his family, they're all actors. But he doesn't know that, that everything in his whole life is fake. And um, he lives on an island. And one of the ways they wanted to make sure that he never actually gets into the real world, because that would spoil everything, they made him afraid of water by planting in a story that his father died in a boating accident. Although that didn't really happen. But... They did that so to keep the character on the island. Right, it's an interesting movie. It's played by uh, Jim Carrey, right? Yes. Uh, and then I was thinking of Four, a character from Divergent, the Divergent series. It's a YA uh, book series and also uh, a movie series. The character is named Four. Yeah, um, it's, uh, the main character is Beatrice or Tris. And uh, Four is kind of a love interest in the story. Uh, as, as the story moves on and he uh, his name is based on the fact that he only has four fears mm. uh, it's, a, it's a big part of the story that people have to uh, go through their fears and in a way face them mm -hmm. and the less fears you have the more respect you get and uh, four only has four fears which is uh, which is kind of amazing they should have called the book the Four Fears of Four. I, I think there's a spin-off book <laughs> called Four, about okay. the life of Four, because he has a, an interesting background story as well. I really recommend the series, uh, especially the book series. Uh, I've read the first... Um, no, I've, I've read all the novels, but I've seen the first movie, and, and I, I've watched the second, and I really didn't like what they did with the second movie. I really like the first one, but I think the essence of the story is kind of lost in the the sequels in, in the movie series. I also liked the first movie. I didn't like the second movie at all. I thought it was horrible. Uh, but the first one was quite good. Yeah, the first is Divergent, the second is Insurgent, and I believe the <clears throat> last part, which I haven't dared to watch, is... Detergent. Uh, <laughs> Allegiant. Okay. 
Yeah, um, let's mention Brandon Sanderson again. All right. Well, in his Reckoner series, the first one is called Steelheart. And the second one is called Firefight. I've already mentioned in a former podcast that the main character is called David. The second part takes place in another location. No longer in New Cargo as the first part, but uh, in another city where another epic rules the area. And it's uh, it's a bit like Venice. There's a lot of water there which also has to do with the nature of the epic. And since David comes from New Cargo, where uh, the entire environment was turned to solid steel by Steelheart, he is afraid of water. So that's also, I think, an interesting example. If your character uh, is not used to uh, certain things that he is confronted with later on in his life, that he fears them because they're just unknown to him. Right, yeah. So he's on a boat in the in the other city, and he really dislikes being on a boat because it's a new sensation for him. It's really scary. That also reminds me of the um, Dragonlance series by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman, where um, in the cast of characters, it's a it's a very traditional D and D based fantasy series. Uh, one of the characters is Flint the Dwarf, and he hates boats and he hates water. And so every time they have to cross a river or a lake, it's a big problem because he doesn't want to get onto the boat and then they have to force him. Or Yeah, it, and it's usually a source of comedy in, in, that, in those <laughs> books. Luckily he's a dwarf, so they can toss him. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody tosses a dwarf! <laughs> And then, of course, we've also mentioned Harry Potter almost every uh, episode so far, so let's do that again. Ron Weasley um, has arachnophobia. The first time you uh, really notice this is in the Chamber of Secrets, in which uh, spiders play an important part. Yeah, and and in the third uh, book, uh, Prisoner of Azkaban, there's this whole bit about facing your fears by turning them into something ridiculous, remember? The Boogeyman? Right, yeah. J.K. Rowling's take on the boogeyman is that um, it's an entity that takes the form of your biggest fears. And there's this spell uh, called Ridiculous, where you have to actually ridicule your biggest fear. For example, uh, what Ron does to face his fear of spiders is to imagine the spider with rollerblades so that it actually falls over. To be perfectly honest, when I saw that scene in the movie, I thought the spider with roller skates was even scarier. Really? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Okay, so um, we've mentioned a couple of uh, characters with fears. Now let's talk about certain kinds of fear that you have in, uh, in stories. By the way, we're having rose tea today. It's from a, uh, this brand called Or Tea, and uh, the tea is called La Vie en Rose. <laughs> what do you think? It tastes like potpourri. Yeah, it smells like potpourri also. It smells nice. It's fine. Like potpourri does smell nice. It smells like rose petals, and I guess it, it tastes how you would imagine rose petals would taste. We're not going to talk about fear of rose petals, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the the main fear that comes to mind, it's also a very relatable kind of fear, is the fear of death. Yeah, I think every creature in, in, in the world has it, normally. Normally, yeah. And we've added um, fear of death of a loved one, uh, because that's often an extension of it. When it comes to fear of death... Um, Harry Potter might be another good example, the, the series. Uh, the character of Voldemort is searching for the Philosopher's Stone in the first part. Yeah, he wants to, he wants to flee death. I mean, that's what his name means, right? It's French. Voldemort. He's fly, fleeing from death. Yeah, uh, fear can be very interesting to, to characterize your villain as well. I think there are many examples in classic horror... Um, like death by a maniac or a creature or an animal. <laughs> I, I like that would be a great title for a horror book. Death by a maniac. <laughs> <laughs> you have Psycho. Yeah, yeah. American Psycho. Uh, you have the the Birds uh, by Hitchcock, which is a good example. 
It, it also reminded me of the Black Mirror episode Metalhead, which is about this uh, robot dog chasing a woman and her team. Uh, well, the team doesn't last very long, but especially the woman. <laughs> and it's, it's really scary. It's just uh, a metal dog chasing a woman, but it's, it's really creepy. I think chases do the best work in this respect, like uh, The Wrong Turn and The Hills of Ice, where you have this feeling as, a, as an audience of being constantly chased by really sick people or animals or so something irrational that yeah. will kill you. Um, I think uh, Steven Spielberg's very first movie uh, was the movie Duel. And uh, that was about a guy who was on the road on this long trip in his car. And he was being chased by this big black truck. And you could never see the driver. And it's this very slow, suspenseful build-up. And, and in the end, it becomes this one-on-one -on -one sort of right. very intense... Uh, Confrontation. Right. That's really scary too. And there's this uh, modern um, version of it uh, called Joyride, mm. which is more, I think, aimed towards teenagers. Okay, and then of course, by extension, you also have fear of losing a loved one. So not fear of your own death, but the death of someone else. Uh, first thing that comes to mind for me is um, Anakin Skywalker in uh, Revenge of the Sith. Where, you know, um, his fall to the dark side is largely precipitated by his fear of Padme's death. Yeah, and, and as we mentioned before, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? It was hinted at by Yoda um, when he said... Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. I sense much fear in you. Yeah, and he did suffer a lot. Yeah, also. <laughs> and then um, I think the same thing happens in the time machine where uh, the main character does everything to uh, save his fiancée from death. But it doesn't yeah. seem to work. Th that's in the 2002 version, by the way, because the old movie doesn't have that. Okay. But I thought it was actually... That's why one of the reasons why I think the new one is better. The character actually has a relatable emotional reason for building his time machine. His his loved one dies and he builds the time machine because he wants to go back and avoid her death. Fear is always a very nice way to make a character more relatable or lovable. Yes. Uh, one of my favorite movies and I think a great example of the fear of losing a loved one is, as I've already mentioned, Mrs. Brisby in The Secret of Nim, where, of course, she's afraid of, you know, her children dying. Uh, which is, of course, very understandable and uh, a very big motivator for the story. Right. Um, I think you can have both as well. So a fear of death and uh, a fear of the death of a loved one. And or having to choose. Yeah, and I think The Hunger Games is a, another great example of that. It starts with Katniss taking part in The Hunger Games. Her sister gets... Um, a ticket to these horrible Hunger Games and she mm. takes her place. So that's the first thing. She's afraid of losing her sister, so she takes her place. That's the the first case of fear. Then, she, of course, she fears her own life in these games because there are a number of champions who have been training to win these games all their lives and she, she hasn't. And then, of course, she meets Pita, who she starts to really like and she can't bear the thought of one of them uh, surviving the games and the other dying so she has to kind of choose between uh, dying or losing a loved one again so it, it, it's a very prominent theme in the Hunger Games and it's very interesting such a cruel series <laughs> really. it's cruel yeah. but I love it <laughs> then there's um, you could um, what a very interesting theme could be is the struggle between the fear of death and a longing for death at the same time or sort of having these two opposed to each other. Exactly, like the, the tension between the Freudian Eros versus Thanatos. Uh, like in, in Shakespeare's Hamlet, everyone of course knows the famous soliloquy. Um, to be or not to be. Yeah, whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune 
or to take arms against the seas of trouble and by opposing and them actually this entire uh, soliloquy is about to commit suicide or not to commit suicide basically yeah actually i was thinking less highbrow of the movie dragonheart um, where the dragon also wants to die because he's the last one of his kind but he's also afraid of dying because well he feels that he's unworthy to join the other dragons in dragon heaven because he hasn't matched up with them right yeah that, that's an interesting example as well yes knight i do long for death but fear it why aside from your misery what's to lose my soul it's it's a bit like theo then as well he he's not afraid to die as such especially if it's a noble death but he he does fear going to the other side without being worthy yeah of facing his ancestors exactly okay then we have a different kind of fear uh, the fear of decay the fear of aging illness disease it's kind of related right that's why the hunger games is another example of this kind of fear because katniss obviously is afraid of uh, getting infections and uh, hunger and uh, things like that physical pain then you have examples like war movies uh, where people are afraid of of suffering uh, World War Z would be a good example, where kind of there's this, a zombie movie. Yeah, zombie infestation all around the world, and people are really scared of, yeah, turning into one of those things. Being yeah, getting hurt or or turning into one of those, which is actually worse. So on a different level, the picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. That book is really about the fear of growing older and losing your good looks and your charm, etc. Exactly, that's a very good example. Uh, because in the in the in that story, he has this portrait, and it's kind of a curse that, as he grows older, his portrait actually takes on that burden. The portrait grows older, and he stays young. I thought that recent movie version was really creepy. It was extremely creepy, yeah. uh, in large part because it was so bizarrely sexual. But it was it was actually quite a, it had a gothic vibe to it. Anyway, the the fear of aging is also called gerascophobia, apparently, and uh, and of course we can mention Peter Pan in this respect again, he, who has a fear of aging, and therefore yeah. never wants to grow up. Yeah. Also, I remember this movie, and it was called Death Becomes Her, and it was about these women who wanted to stay young, and then. Um, they did something that they, they sort of, they stayed young and they couldn't die, but they got hurt and broken and in the end, you know, their heads fell off, etc. And they were still alive, so it was actually really, but it was a comedy, it was sort of a black comedy. I think this fear also recurs in uh, vampire movies. Yeah, that might be. Because the vampire, uh, choosing to become a vampire might be the ultimate problem solver if you have a fear of aging. Yeah, exactly. And in uh, in Anne Rice's version, at least, Interview with the Vampire, the, it, the theme is very clear, clearly present that as the vampire lives on throughout the ages and ages, he becomes very weary and he, he just he can't stand it. You know, he can't stand life anymore because it feels pointless. It feels he's just carrying on sure, and, yeah. and to, no, to no real purpose. So... Um, then we have the really irrational fears or the sort of um, deep-seated, weird kinds of fears, which we call phobias. Yeah, so a third um, kind of fear would, would be phobias. For animals, heights, confined places are all kinds of phobias. There are really absurd ones, even. And I think there are lots of movies with plot lines that have been entirely inspired by one phobia. For example, the movie Arachnophobia. Yeah, <laughs> or snakes on a plane, which is obviously about a fear of snakes. Yes, it's a very deep and thoughtful masterpiece. And the scary two notes of Jaws. Yeah. <laughs> then you have the birds uh, of uh, Alfred Hitchcock, also Vertigo, a fear of heights. 
Yeah, yeah, of course. Then there's this condition, um, which I, I'm quite sympathetic to. It's called coulrophobia, and that's a fear of clowns. I personally think clowns are very creepy also. And the movie It, and the book, of course, um, is a very good example of, you know, using that fear. Yeah, I think um, claustrophobia is also one that has been used in lots of movies, like uh, in Panic Room, I think, and, and also to some extent in Alien, because you have this horror story uh, on a spaceship, and yeah. you cannot leave it. So that's The movie certainly feels very claustrophobic. Yeah. There are really, really weird fears. Hard Times, uh, it's, it's a book, uh, a classic one, uh, deals with actually a fear of fantasy because the um, the father in the story really wants his children to stay down to earth and uh, not use their imagination everything should be logical and rational and i could always relate to that uh, book i really loved it because uh, we flemish people are a bit like that <laughs> not me <laughs> it's it's a it's a cultural thing sometimes we we feel like aliens here because in flanders like the hobbits kind of have a fear of adventure. Uh, the Flemish people have, have a fear of fantasy stories. And lots of Flemish people are actually embarrassed to admit that they think a fantasy movie is good. It's very strange. It's I've really never strange. had it. I've always been in love with fantasy from a very young age. But, um, <clears throat> but it's true. If you notice, uh, Belgian or you know Flemish literature has usually been very gloomy, very realistic about social issues and problems. And even today, most Belgian movies and TV series are about these very sort of mundane and gloomy and sort of um, kind of sad, earthy. Exactly. It's kind of, yeah, it's, it's a very Belgian thing. And I hate it. I hate it so much. Exactly. Uh, and it, it's weird uh, when people from Flanders or, or from Belgium, I'm not quite sure um, whether it's, it's a, a national thing really or a Flemish thing, when they come from the, the movie theater and they've seen a, a fantasy movie, they're always kind of... They hide behind their coats and they quickly run to their cars. <laughs> They're always kind of justifying why they picked the movie. Like, yeah, someone told me it was kind of okay. Uh, My kids wanted to see it. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I, I don't usually watch fantasy because, you know, it's, it's, it's not real and it's strange. But yeah, this one was okay because it was, uh, this, the cinematography was cool and, and the visuals were stunning. And, and they will always say things like that. And if they do like it and I cannot hide it, they will say something like... I appreciate the special effects or something, or the, the work that they put into it. Or. It's an exception that they, they really love this movie. It's really strange. I think it's because we don't have this tradition um, that, for example, the English very much do have, and the Germans with the fairy tales, of fantasy storytelling, the fantastic um, and the mythology, etc., being used to sort of talk about deeper themes we don't have that tradition. Even our medieval literature, if you go back to the Abelospelen, it's always yeah. about these realistic things. Right. Um, but in the, for the English and the Germans and even the French, there is more... That fantastical element has always been there more. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the closest thing we have to, uh, to kind of a, a legend about our uh, ancestry is uh, the Lion of Flanders. Which is which a, is not a, actually about a lion. It's a guy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a poorly written book actually about our um, our past uh, war experience and and how noble and and great we were in battle and and how courageous the the Flemish were. But actually, it's a bit over the top and it was always popular and considered literature. But yeah, I think not really a lot of people really like it. I, I never read books originally written in Dutch, ever. But our point actually is um, that culture can kind of come with these traditional fears. Yes. Strange fears sometimes. Like the American fear, you know which one I'm talking about? Yeah. This is something <laughs> we wanted to mention. 
We've both noticed that in American movies and TV shows, characters have this very weird fear of saying I love you. It's very odd. I don't know. Is it is it a TV and movie thing or is it a real thing among Americans? I don't know. Yeah, we'd like to know actually. It's really strange. Like there was this episode of Frasier where um, they went on a fishing trip with their dad uh, because they wanted their dad to say to them, I love you, because he'd never said that. And he had a really hard time saying to his sons, I love you, because it was so difficult for him to get those words across his lips. And in romantic comedies, people break up because uh, someone said, I love you too soon. <laughs> and someone said it uh, not soon enough. It's, it's really weird. We, we think it's really weird. Yes, we Belgians think that is weird. I think most Europeans think that that is weird. Yeah, I think it goes along with the weird tendency to sleep around with everyone without being scared. <laughs> I don't know if that's typically American, I don't know. Well, actually, the, the impression we get from American series and movies is that Americans fear the words I love you more than venereal diseases. <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, it seems that way. Sorry uh, if we've offended anyone. <laughs> so, if you feel the urge to explain to us, please do, because it's been puzzling our minds for a while now. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there are other uh, fears connected to a particular culture. Um, like, you know, the Gauls were afraid of uh, the sky falling down onto their heads. <laughs> I guess the Vikings were always afraid of Ragnarok. Um, but today, uh, it's harder for me to tell. Yeah, anyway, um, let's talk about some weird phobias. Yes, we've... <laughs> a bit on a side note, but we come up with this list of strange phobias that apparently do exist. One of which is phobophobia, the fear of getting a phobia, getting a fear. Wow, phobiaception. Yeah. And then you have a, a blutophobia, which is a fear of bathing and cleaning. Then we have arithmophobia. I've got that. That's a fear of numbers. Yeah. Boo. So like you have this movie, The Number 23, <laughs> with, uh, also with um, Jim Carrey, I believe. Yes. Which is about a guy having a fear of the number 23 because it kind of comes back in his life and always he sees it as a, an omen and he gets paranoid and, and he writes on the walls and you know the drill. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have plutophobia, fear of money. Yeah. I don't really know anyone with this kind of phobia. But there should be a name for um, clients having a fear of paying your invoices, so I would like to know, because I know a lot of clients who have it. And then there is, of course, sesquipedalophobia. A fear of long words. Yes, and if you have sesquipedalophobia, you need to have hippopotamonstro sesquipedalophobia. Fear of very long words. Okay, so that was a little side note of weird phobias. Let's go to the next category. By the way, tell us about your weird phobias, if you have any. Yes. The fear of guilt and sin, the fear of committing a crime. I immediately thought of werewolf stories where you don't actually have control over your actions and you might be scared of, of killing a loved one while you're a werewolf. Yeah, afraid of what you might have done that you don't remember. Yeah, yeah this comes back in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, in The Hulk. Right, and I think also in, in X-Men... Where you have Rogue, who is afraid of um, hurting uh, boyfriends because she kind of drains their life essence. Yeah, whenever she touches someone. Yeah, which is yeah. kind of problematic for your sex life. And then you have Cyclops, who kind of... Um, he can make everyone explode if he puts his glasses off. So that's hey, Isn't this in Twilight also? Isn't Edward afraid that he can't stop his... Hunger and that he'll bite Bella and suck yeah. her blood. Yeah, it's a theme that, that comes back in, in vampire stories as well. Many superheroes break up with their girlfriends because they're afraid to hurt them. Yeah, right. That's something that, uh, that happens a lot. It's a bit overused, I think. Then you have uh, a fear of losing your reputation or a fear of a scandal. Yes. That is, if you have a good reputation. If you don't have one, you cannot really 
lose it. I immediately thought of this uh, this book uh, by Nathaniel Hawthorne, The Scarlet Letter, where a, a woman uh, has to wear the scarlet letter A, which stands for adultery because she has committed adultery. And she is put to shame. So she is actually afraid of uh, how people will react uh, as they, they watch her with this letter on her chest. And I, I, I loved reading that book. Uh, although it's not really my genre, but I had to. <laughs> I thought it had some interesting themes. It's been a while now, so I don't really m remember the details of it, but um, the emotions that she goes through, the fears, are really described in a very natural way that make you identify with her a lot. You know, um, we've been talking a lot about fear being used in a serious way, but it can also be used in a funny way. So now that we're talking about fear of losing your reputation, fear of scandal, um, that's in the British TV sitcom Keeping Up Appearances. Very much the case. You know, the main character, Hyacinth Bouquet, is this very snobbish uh, woman. And um, she does everything to try to appear like she's, you know, sophisticated and well off and very respectable. And, um, of course, always, every time something happens that ruins it all, every episode, it's just really funny to see her struggle against that and um, trying to keep up appearances. She kind of deserves it, right? Yes, because she is a, a, an awful person. Uh, she mistreats her husband, her neighbors, uh, all out of her desire to appear as someone very important and very respectable. I also thought it was a bit tragic, even though it's supposed yeah. to be funny. But it, it is fun. It is funny. But yeah, there's a tragic element to it. Um, this fear of reputation and scandal, uh, it's also something that comes back in some episodes of Black Mirror, which is actually a very popular series. Um, nowadays, it's It is usually about fears and the fear of uh, especially technology and the progress of, of it all and what it will do to uh, humankind. And I think two, um, two episodes that come to mind with this theme is Nosedive. It's one of my favorites. It's the first one, the first episode I've watched from Black Mirror and I really liked it. It's about this woman who does everything to keep up her reputation which is actually measured in a kind of rating like we have facebook and everyone gets a popularity rating and she really wants to be popular and um, it's one of the only episodes of black mirror that i like she gets perks for having a, a higher reputation and if you have a lower reputation then some things are just not accessible to you for example you cannot buy some types of houses you cannot rent uh, that particular car so it comes with kind of perks it, it was an interesting yeah. take um, I, i generally have a vigorous dislike of the series black mirror but i did really like that episode that was the one with bryce dallas howard right yes yeah i think it's still one of my favorites uh, even uh, now i've watched all of the seasons actually Some of the episodes are really, really disturbing. Some of, some them, of them make me want to puke. Yeah, some of them. And they make me really angry, even really just disgusting. thinking about them. <laughs> yeah, sorry, go on. The pig episode was really disgusting. Some people yes. know what I'm talking that about. That was the very first episode. Luckily, we haven't watched that first because Netflix kind of displayed them in the, uh, the wrong order, which was... For that reason, good. probably, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I would have I would have never watched any other episode if if that had been the first. Yeah, ditto. Another episode that I disliked because I didn't think it was really credible was Crocodile, where um, where there's a, a hit and run, and this woman wants to um, <clears throat> who's really successful. She wants to keep herself from losing her precious reputation, and when the guy who was involved in the hit and run comes back and, and feels remorse and wants to come clean. She kills him and then uh, this turns into a killing spree just because one person after another is uh, knows about what she did. And mm. 
I don't think it's really credible because she was the one who didn't want to leave the corpse there in the first place. So it was a really, really disturbing episode that I didn't like. But it's a good example of someone doing everything to keep her reputation from exploding. Yeah, it's a good example, definitely, yeah. Um, Another example of someone being afraid of losing their reputation or scandal would be Simba in The Lion King. To talk about something completely different than Black Mirror, Simba thinks he is guilty of his father's death. Well, mostly because his uncle, who is actually the real killer, tells him so. And so he runs away. And uh, he stays away and he avoids his responsibilities because he's afraid that, you know, people will look at him and say, there he is, there's the one who got our king killed. Yeah, I think uh, these examples show that a character can go in all kinds of directions because of their fear of losing their reputation. They can, um, this can disable them to take action or this can make them take bad actions. So you can do all kinds of things uh, with that. Fears can be great motivations for characters, I think. A new uh, topic, a fear that... I personally find very interesting and um, appealing. I mean, appealing in the sense that it's it's genuinely scary, I think, is um, the fear of losing yourself, the fear of losing your identity. There's the fear of being killed by a monster, but then there's the fear of becoming the monster, and the second one is much worse and much scarier and creepier, I think. I guess uh, it's in a lot of horror, um, you know, Take any zombie movie like World War Z or um, Night of the Living Dead. You know, when you get bitten by a zombie, you turn into the zombie. Uh, That's scarier than just being eaten and killed because you don't want to be running around like one of those things, you know? (laughs) Yeah, and in a way, this comes back in The Will of the Woods, uh, one of our own stories where Newswick uh, faces a gate. And one of the things the gate says is, um, the innocent will lose themselves. And as a rascal who is not afraid of anything, like most of these little boys, he just steps through the gate. I guess it's kind of a sin in a way, because, you know, as a little innocent child, it's precisely because he's so innocent that he's susceptible to the snares of, um, of sin. So I guess it's kind of a metaphor for that. Yeah, and uh, curiosity is, uh, is a bitch, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's another way of putting it. <laughs> And that's why, yeah, it's hard to talk about this without spoiling anything. So I'll just leave it at that. And um, what I thought was really interesting in The Hunger Games is uh, Pita at one time confessing to Katniss that he he doesn't really fear death as much, but the thing he fears most is losing himself, losing his identity. He's afraid that the game makers and um, the situation he's put in, life or death situation, that it will change him as a person, that it will turn him into someone that he doesn't want to be. And I thought that was really, that was an interesting scene. Yeah, and it's even worse when you realize that that actually does happen to him. Yeah. But he's, he's, he's okay in the end. He's okay in the end. But <laughs> yeah, yeah that, was, that was hard. That was hard. It's such a cruel, cruel series. But it's good. Yeah, cruel, but awesome. Then um, another fear is the fear of abandonment, the fear of loneliness. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think that's something that a lot of horror movies play with. Also, I think movies with children, small children usually have a fear of abandonment and loneliness. I think it's uh, especially interesting when you have a a child's main character. That's true, yeah. So we've had seven fears so far. Um, Let's just not mention the eighth one. No, you know, because we both suffer from octophobia and we decided not to talk about fear number eight. (laughs) Okay, let's go straight to number nine then. (sighs) Number nine is the fear of losing freedom. For some people, uh, and they're probably right, losing your freedom is worse than death. Yeah, I think this, this is one of my biggest fears. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and you're probably right, I guess. But a lot of people just haven't really thought about it and don't really realize that because they take freedom for granted. Right. No, not me. I realize it. Uh, and I always have nightmares about the government and stuff, yeah. It's, really, <laughs> it's awful, yeah. A great example is Braveheart, of course. 
he would rather be tortured to death than give up his freedom. Yeah, and rightly so. I really understand that guy. I think there's a, a lot of Black Mirror episodes as well about this, uh, this especially fear of entrapment. Uh, for example, in USS Callister. I won't explain every episode because you've probably watched them. But in this particular episode, like some others, a digital copy of yourself is made and put into a kind of a fantasy a science fiction world, the fantasy of, of this maniac. And the characters are, they have their own consciousness, even though they're copies, but they still have the entire consciousness of the, the real people. And they're entrapped in this fantasy of this guy and they really want to escape. If I may go on a little tangent here, this is one of the issues that I have with the series Black Mirror is that it's supposed to be this sort of comment on technology and where it's taking us and what it will do to society. But then the majority of the episodes are all about the same thing, which is something that will never, ever exist because it's complete fabrication. Well, I, I wouldn't say it's the majority of the episodes, but it's, it's a lot. Many, many episodes are about this sort of uh, copying consciousness and... And putting consciousness, human consciousness into something, into a technological device and stuff like that. They don't even know what consciousness is on a scientific level. That will never happen. Yeah, I have to say these are my least favorite episodes. And this will probably be very, very, very controversial. But my absolute least favorite episode of Black Mirror is San Junipero, actually. Not only did I think it was pretty boring... Uh, it took me a while before I really got what it was about, but um, then that was actually the first episode I watched in which the big reveal was that it, it was about uh, these people <clears throat> that went to a kind of digital heaven where their consciousness was uploaded and it was so ridiculous. I don't, really don't get why it won a lot of prizes for storytelling. Definitely. Uh, for me, the episode San Junipero really bothered me because it reflected this idea of hubris, much like in, in other science fiction stories. But instead of the hubris being something, you know, bad that, it, that gets punished, it actually gets praised in this episode and the characters get rewarded for their sort of utter disrespect for for human life the human soul really um i thought it was disgusting as an episode of doctor who where something similar happens uh, where someone dies and it's suggested in the episode that the doctor saves this person by putting her into a kind of computer like putting her sort of whatever a digital consciousness thing whatever in one of those typical vague undefined Doctor Who terms into a into this sort of digital computer environment and that's sort of presented as kind of saving this person imprisoning her in a computer I thought that was horrible yeah eternal entrapment that's a fear in its own yeah but presenting that as something good I thought it was just awful really awful yeah which brings us to fear of change yes Bilbo is obviously a good example in The Hobbit. Um, he doesn't want any adventures. I'm looking for someone to share in an adventure. An adventure? Now, I don't imagine anyone west of Bree would have much interest in adventures. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things. Make you late for dinner. <laughs> but... There is an element of deep down he does want it. There's a, a part of him that does want it. Yeah, I think that's uh, very realistic uh, in a way. We can all relate to that, right? Because on the one hand, we all want our lives to be different and we want excitement and adventure and we want progress. But at the same time, we're often very scared of leaving our comfort zone. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I think another example... A uh, fear of change is uh, in Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. Um, Miss Havisham is a, an iconic example of someone who really doesn't want her life to change. In a more recent 
uh, example. Uh, in uh, Star Wars, The Force Awakens, the character of Rey is afraid of leaving the planet where she lives, Jakku, uh, because she was abandoned there by her parents. Aha, fear of abandonment. <laughs> <laughs> And um, she thinks they'll return someday. So she doesn't really want to leave the place because, who knows, this might be the day when they return. Maybe that's fear of reality. Ooh, another fear. Fear of reality, yeah. Um, apparently, um, Don Quixote has that, whom we mentioned last time. Anyway, there are fears enough. Uh, with um, This was the 10th category we've mentioned. Maybe we should still say something about the importance of fear in the horror genre, which might seem very obvious. Well, yeah, it's all about fear. Uh, the idea is to invoke fear in the audience. But I think there's a difference between what you would call, you know, the slasher movie type of thing mm -hmm. and the more supernatural horror. I've always felt that supernatural horror is simultaneously more interesting, more philosophically interesting, but perhaps less directly scary than the slasher movie. And the reason is that in a slasher movie, you're being chased by some uh, maniac with a chainsaw or a knife. So that's simply the fear of death and pain. Uh, that's very basic. Everyone has that. Uh, if you don't, then there's something wrong with you. But very effective, nonetheless. Yeah, it's very effective for that reason. But the, the more supernatural horror, like the, the exorcism movies, etc., they are about more substantial, more existential fears. Um, the fear of, uh, you know, uh, losing um, your soul, really. Damnation, death of the soul, spiritual death. Um, it's... Much more interesting, much more profound, but a bit uh, sort of farther removed, a bit... Um... Yeah, I, I do agree that in the horror genre, choosing a different fear than fear of death or pain can make your movie entirely different and more interesting and, and kind of bring out the, the deeper themes in, in the story. Yeah, like the picture of Dorian Gray, I think, is a good example. What makes that movie or that book so 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 gruesome because i do think of it as a horror piece is how his soul gets tarnished how ugly it becomes and and that is far more profound than just being eaten by a monster <laughs> and of course uh, fear plays a, a big part in other genres as well like the detective the fear of being next For right. Example, yeah. Uh, or, or in the case of the detective, not being able to solve the crime before not getting your promotion, the next, the next victim uh, gets killed, or not getting yeah. your promotion. That that's terrible. Well, in a romantic comedy, even there's fear. I, I think there's fear in every genre. In a romantic comedy, the fear would be, you know, uh, yeah, not getting together with uh, the desired loved one. In drama, there's also um, usually uh, a theme of fear, like uh, the, the movie A Beautiful Boy that I've mentioned before. Um, By a Belgian director. It's full of fear. It's, uh, it's an, an awful story in the sense that it makes you feel awful, but it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful movie, actually. And it's very realistic, and it's about drug addiction, and it's by a Belgian director. Yeah, it's about drug addiction. Flemish director. <laughs> And that makes it <laughs> depressing, in a way. It's about drug addiction, but uh, I think it's, it's more about fear, actually. In case of the main character, the fear of losing control. He is so dominated and controlled by these drugs that he is unable to stop this urge of taking it and taking it further. Uh, in the case of the parents, they... They are afraid of losing their son. Uh, not only are they afraid uh, that he might die of an overdose, but also they're afraid of losing their precious son in the sense that he will change, that his identity will change, that he will lose himself, basically. So I think a lot of drama movies are about that, the fear of disappointment, the fear of failure as well, all kinds of fears. I think a good... Story always has its fair share of fears. Hmm, that's interesting. Then another thing I would like to mention is that what you often see in stories is that overcoming fear 
uh, and winning the respect of the people becomes this core element of the storytelling. Right, and usually as the plot progresses, um, the main character will will have to face his fears, uh, overcome his own fears or even shared fears to, to gain respect, to achieve something. Um, one thing I, I, I think about one story is How to Train Your Dragon, where Hiccup actually manages to catch a Nightcrawler, which is the most fearsome dragon there is. Everyone fears it, so and, and he, he is not respected at all. He's clumsy. Even though he's the son of the chief, everyone kind of laughs at him. But when he catches this Nightcrawler, everyone's kind of in awe because they've always thought it was the most mysterious and fearsome scary dragon that was around i guess a very similar thing is in avatar when jake sui tames the toruk makto i uh, know he becomes the toruk makto um, by taming uh, toruk right uh, which is this this big giant bird thing <laughs> that's sort of the terror of the skies and he tames it and so wins back the respect of the the other navi people Yeah, and it's something he has to do in a story to uh, to gain the respect of his uh, love interest back because there was this classical "I trusted you" scene. Yeah. Yes, it's it's a very traditional story. The way I had it figured, Taruk is the baddest cat in the sky. Nothing attacks him. Easy boy. So why would he ever look up? But that was just a theory. I think it's a kind of coming of age or rite of passage type mm -hmm. thing very often also. Um, facing your fears and like in the movie 300 in the beginning with the boy um, having to defeat the wolf. If you remember that scene. Yeah. That was, you know, a, a rite of passage. And, you know, if once you've done that, what will scare you, you know? It's also something that frequently occurs in... Movies about other cultures where people have to kill a bear and um, bathe in its blood just to prove that they've become a yeah. man. Yeah, I, I think more. in Dune, in the book Dune, it, it's also, you know, that it's very similar to Avatar. There's a scene where Paul has to tame a worm and he picks the biggest worm, the f most fearsome worm to, to tame. I think I remember that, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I think there are numerous examples of this in storytelling. So, um, now we've mentioned a bunch of fears. If you have the guts to complete our list by adding a number eight, <laughs> then please do so in the comments section. Uh, so, Domin, would you say you have a, a conclusion to this entire episode about fears uh, and the parts that fears play in uh, storytelling? Yeah, I would say that fear is a part of any story. You almost can't have a story without some element of fear. And um, another thing that I would say is that um, giving your character a certain kind of fear makes the character more relatable, more interesting. Whether it's a villain or a good guy or a side character, doesn't really matter It could be used in a comedic way, it could be used in a very serious way. If there are countless movies or books where someone, you know, has this deep-seated fear of something and then later on it's revealed in a flashback that they have a trauma and something happened long ago that gave them this fear. And it makes characters just more rounded and more interesting. And then my third conclusion would be that spiritual fears in particular are more interesting than you know the straightforward fear of physical danger. I would agree. I think um, adding a fear to a character is usually a quick fix. If you think, um, oh, my character is not round enough, it still feels flat, it's, it's missing something, then adding a fear to this character can really change the way uh, the reader experiences um, the character. So... So I, I, that's why I thought it was a, an interesting topic to talk about. So yeah, that was this week's episode and we hope you've enjoyed it. And um, 
We'll be back again, of course, with a new topic. In the meantime, be sure to check out our audio stories if you haven't yet. There's Witch Hunter, The Beast of the Western Wilds and The Will of the Woods. More are coming. I know it's been a while since anything new has come out, but it takes time. If, if you know, you want it to be any good, it, it just really takes a lot of time. So we have to ask you for your patience. Yeah, also Domain is just afraid that it will suck. Actually, you it touched on something there. Um, I do have that fear. Uh, and that's, that is a bit of a hurdle. But I will overcome it. We shall overcome. All right. Okay. So um, check out our Bandcamp page and... Um, Subscribe, uh, like and follow us on Twitter if you want uh, latest news on audio epics. And we'll be back next time with a new topic. Bye. Bye.